I'd like to start out with a word of prayer if we could. Father, I just thank you for your presence tonight, for your presence is so sweet. Father, I thank you for the people that are here. And Father, though I may be the one standing up here, it is not at all about me. For it is all about you, all about the Lord Jesus Christ, and all about his Holy Spirit. Father, I pray you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that understands. And Holy Spirit, I give you the freedom to do that which you do so well. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen and amen. It's good to see you guys here tonight. And as the pastor said, I, I spoke on this uh, Friday night, so to some of you guys, I know this is gonna be, might sound a little repetitive to you, but we'll see where the Holy Spirit takes it from here. You know, if we're all honest with ourselves and to God, we're all a work in progress, aren't we? You know, I found that in the kingdom of God, there's a lot that we need to learn yet and a lot that we can work on. And each one of us has a different story, and each one of us has been on a different journey to get to where we are now. <clears throat> but the results are the same. We're all sons and daughters of God. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're all members of God's family. <clears throat> and I know I'm partial to my family, but to be called a member of his family is far beyond what I can imagine. What a blessing it is to be considered a part of his family. And what an honor it is to call him my father. You know, there never is an end to what we can learn about the father. We, I don't think there's anybody here that has reached the pinnacle of, of where God has called you and what God sees in you. There's such a depth to the father that I can't even, I can't even explain. You know, Jesus himself was only on this earth for three and a half years, and John says in the last verse of his great gospel that if you took everything that Jesus did while he walked on here on earth and wrote it in a book, you could not contain those books in this earth. Could you imagine how much more there is to learn about God? We will never even get to the point where we learn everything about Jesus Christ himself. That's how deep he is. You know, as, as pieces in a puzzle, as, pe as no two pieces are the same and they don't fit in the same spot, and so are we. we might, the, the pieces in the puzzle might not even be near any, each other in that puzzle, but still they fit in that puzzle. And rest assured that your piece fits in God's ordained spot for you in that puzzle, and God's ordained spot for you in this local church. <clears throat> so I encourage you, with all that is within me, don't be a missing piece in that puzzle. Surrender for God, to God's will for your life, because this puzzle won't be complete without you. I mentioned it Friday night, and I think it bears mentioning today. My wife and I have been a part of this church, have been coming to this church since August of 2020. And then when we came in here, you could sense the, the love of God in this place. But the thing that really stood out to us and showed us and confirmed to us that this was the place we were supposed to be was the truth of God's word that was coming from behind this pulpit. And that turned out to be not just a one Sunday happening, but it's been an every Sunday happening. The truth of God's word and the reliability of his word is preached strongly in this church. We are told that we can have faith in it, stand on it, trust in it, and we're encouraged to walk in it. And I would like to thank our pastor for that because this is something you can't say in every church that's out there. And I'm thankful that God led us to this church. You know, what I'm about to say, I'm sure everybody here can agree with. And that is, I don't like to be lied to. I don't like to be willfully deceived. I don't like to be misled. I don't like to be told a half-truth because everybody knows a half-truth is a little more than a lie. I want and need the truth, even though sometimes the truth hurts, even though sometimes that truth comes up against my flesh and my flesh gets a little sore from hearing it. But that tells me I'm the one that needs to change, not the Word of God, because the Word of God is true. 
and I need to come in line with the Word of God. Every month, every week, every day, I have to make decisions. And granted, some of those decisions are easy, they're, they're easily solved. But how many, knows that some, how many know that sometimes decisions come across your path that are life-altering and may even be life or death consequences to it? And I want to make those decisions by standing on the firm foundation of the truth. We are living in a time in this country like most of us have ever experienced before. I know you've heard it said that things we have, were taught that were good are now said to be bad. And things that we are taught that were bad are now said to be good. A whole lot of people have lost trust and faith in the media, in leaders in government, in leaders in business, medical experts, our Justice Department, the FBI, and our school system. And the, light, light, and the list could go on and on. So in a world where it seems like it doesn't matter if you're telling the truth or not, and integrity is at an all-time low, who do we go to for the truth? Who do we go to for clear direction? Who do we go to for guidance and to lead us out of through all this mess? Who do we go to? We, know, we need to go to the one who leads us into all truth. One who has proven over the years that he'll never leave us or forsake us. One who has showed us he'll never lie to us or mislead us. We need to trust in what God said. And just as importantly, we need to trust and listen to what he's saying today. Because I don't know if you got, I know you guys know this. God is still talking to his people. That has never stopped and it never will stop. He is not silent. He will talk to anyone who will listen to him. You know, it says in uh, John 17, that great chapter in the book of John, where it's, it, 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 that whole chapter is nothing but Jesus praying to the Father. What has happened is that he has just had his last meal, meal with the disciples, and he's only a few hours away from being arrested by the temple guards. And as he's praying to the Father, he looks to the Father and says, your word is truth. Now, who would know better than that than Jesus himself to make that statement? The word is truth because he lived it and he walked it. He knows better than anyone. He staked his life on what God told him. Even though he knew what lied ahead of him, he knew that he was within hours of being taken away and turned over to the temple guards. And yet he still trusted in what his father told him. He still trusted in him. In John 1.17, it says, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In John 14.6, he himself said about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 18, 13, while he stood before Pilate, only a few hours before he himself was to be crucified, he said, I came into the world to bear witness of the truth. In John 16, 13, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth who will guide you into all truth. Are you starting to see a pattern here? There's a case that is built here that the Godhead is all about truth. All three of them is all about truth. And they want the truth told. Why? Because millions of people have had their lives ruined because they believed a lie. Sadder yet, millions of people have gone to hell because they believed a lie. We need to look at the one who is the source of all truth. As Christians, when situations come up in our lives, as we know, they, all, they surely will. The first question out of our mouths should be, God, what do I do now? God, what do I do now? Before you even go to anybody else for advice, even your spouse, you should go to him and say, God, what do I do now? But I have to admit, I haven't always done that. Some of the times the first question out of my mouth was, what am I going to do now? Do you notice the difference there? On one hand, God, what do I do? But I have chosen to say, what do I do? As if I knew what the future held. As if I controlled the situation. But let me tell you, I can't do any of those things. And the more I ask myself the question of what, what, do, what am I going to do, the more the anxiety would build. Why? 
because I didn't have a clue of what to do. I didn't have any idea what to do. I needed to turn away from the spirit of fear and turn to the one that gives me a sound mind. How many know that if you take time to listen to what God tells you to do and more importantly, to do what he tells you to do, things are going to work out. Remember what Jesus' mother said, to the, said at, the, at the wedding of Cana. Whatever he says to do, do it. I mean, that sounds like good advice to me. Whatever the Lord is telling you, just do it. Do it without question. I'd take, like to take a few minutes to look at Psalm 23. It's a, it's a psalm that's so familiar to all of us. We've heard it a number of times. But there's things in this psalm that really point to what I think God wants us to look at tonight. So let's take a few minutes to look at that. Verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's not just skip over those first five words, because those first five words are very important. This psalm was written by David, and he knows intimately and firsthand what a shepherd is and what a shepherd does, because he spent his boyhood life as a shepherd. He knows a shepherd leads, feeds and protects he is saying the lord is my guide my protector my provider he watches over me and he where he leads i'll follow in other words i do what he says like a sheep i do what he says and that is why he's able to see able to say i am without want because he knows the Lord will provide all his needs. He knows that from experience. You can't have the last part of that verse, I shall not want, without having a firm grip on the first part of that verse. Without, without knowing in your heart that, your Lord is your, that the Lord is your shepherd. And you can't know that the Lord is your shepherd without having your needs met. You can't separate those two statements. They're interlocked. They're married together. You can't have one without the other. Each day, it's up to us to decide who's going to lead us for that day, who is going to be our, be our shepherd. And sometimes it's, a not, it's not a question of who's going to lead us, but what's going to lead us. Are we going to allow outside circumstances to lead us? Are we going to allow our desires to lead us? Are we going to allow the opinions of others to lead us? Are we going to allow fear? That's a big one. Are we going to allow fear to lead us? Are we going to allow pride to lead us? Are we going to allow our emotions to lead us? Or are we going to turn to God and look for Him for leading? And what if, what if we actually took this first verse, the Lord is my shepherd and shall not want, and what if we claimed that every morning? As soon as we swing our legs out of bed, we, we stand up or you sit right there in bed and you raise your hands above your head and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do you think that that would have an impact on us? Do you think that would have an impact on your day? I certainly do. It's not that we're reminding him of who he is to us. We're reminding ourselves. And how many know that we need to do that on occasion? We need to remind ourselves who he is. Because sometimes the enemy tries to bull rush you. He tries to bring on things on you like a flood. And, that, and it is good to say, and it's good to remind yourself, and it's good to remind him that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Now, depending on the storm you go through, you might have to say that 10 times a day. You may have to say that every 10 minutes, but say it. Say it as many times as you need to say it. You tell him and you don't put a doubt in his mind that the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want. You let him know it. I'd like to, I think it's so interesting. I think it's, it's amazing, actually. When you look at the first part of that verse where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, the word shepherd there, it is so interesting. The word shepherd there in Hebrew is the word ra'ah. It's, bar, it's spelled R-A apostrophe A. 
and it's used in this word, verse to describe shepherd. And it means just what we think of what a shepherd is. Just like I said, he leads, he feeds, he tend, he, and, he, and he provides for his sheep. But in Hebrew, it has another meaning. It's a common word in Hebrew for best friend. So you could rightly say, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me, he feeds me, he protects me, and he's my best friend. I can't think of a better thing to call him other than the Lord God Almighty, but be able to call him my best friend. Because when you think about what a best friend is and what a best friend does, he looks out for you. He wants the best for you. So I think it's awesome that that word was, was put in there and used. Psalm 23, 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Do you see it there? He leads me. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. God's heartfelt desire to, leave every, to lead every one of his children. That means he's in front of me, in front of me, not behind me. He knows what's up ahead, and he gets there before I do. God wants us to know tonight that he is in the leading business. He majors in that. He wants that. He wants to lead you out of temptation. He wants to lead you from the traps of the enemy. He wants to lead you from confusion. He wants to lead you from darkness. He wants to lead you from lack, and he wants to lead you from sickness. He wants to lead you from addictions. He wants to lead you. And he wants to leave you, lead you because he loves you. That's the basis of this whole thing. He loves you so much, he wants to lead you away from danger. He wants to lead you from the, from the, like I said, the traps of the enemy into his blessing. But it's not automatic. It's not automatic that he leads you because you, you have a part to play in this. You have to allow him to lead you. You've got to ask him to lead you. And that takes a little bit of effort. That means you have to give some time. You've got to sit down, just you and him, in a, in a quiet place and begin talking to him and allow him to lead you. And take the time to listen to him and see what he has to say. Don't just ask and pop up and leave. Sit there and wait and wait upon the Lord. If it means re reading your Bible, praying, or just simply sit there and just having a conversation to him. Allow him to lead you. Verse 3, he restores my soul, which is the, our minds, will, and emotions. The very things that the enemy attacks relentlessly. The very things that the enemy tries to control, our shepherd restores those. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There it is again. He leads me. David is stressing the leading of the Lord. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Why will I not fear? Because he's with me. He's leading me. I'm not afraid that I'm going to get stuck in that valley, in that dark valley, because I know he's with me. He's going to get me to the other side. There's light at the end, at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> I heard last night that something that stuck with me. This person said, there's never been a storm that didn't end. And oh, how true that is. Keep that in mind when things are bombarding you. There's never a storm that never ends. And that person pointed, pointed out even in the times of Noah, it rained and it stormed for 40 days and 40 nights, and then it came to an end. And it, so it is with our, our shepherd. He'll always be there with us. He'll always lead us out of that, out of that storm. Psalm 23.5. He prepared. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, which speaks of the Holy Spirit. My cup runs over, which speaks of the life more abundantly that Jesus promised all of us for those that, for those that follow him. How did I get to this table? How did I get a seat at this table? He led me. He led me there. And aren't you glad that he led you there? Because when you got there, there are good things waiting for you there. Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, throughout my lifetime, I've heard this psalm in relation to death and funerals. 
But this really isn't a psalm about death. This is a psalm about life. This is a psalm about living a God-led life and the benefits that are with that. It's a psalm about life. <clears throat> I could say, I could say it this way, that while I was following him, good things are following me. Doesn't it sound like the path of the righteous grows brighter than brighter? I know it does to me. I thank, I thank the shepherd. Now let's go, I want to take uh, a look at John chapter 10. Because I want to see what Jesus says about this shepherd. I wonder what his opinion is of the shepherd. Be chapter 10, verse 14. And it starts off with, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am that shepherd that David was talking about. I am the one who will meet your needs. I am the one who will restore your soul. I am the one who walks with you through that dark valley. I am the one that anoints you. I am the one that gives you life more abundantly. I am the one. I am the good shepherd. You know, in John, chapter, in, in John uh, 10, 3, it says, I know my sheep by name. Man, I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. I like knowing that I'm not just a nameless face in the crowd. Because there's been times in my life where I felt like I was, I've been forgotten. But I know from this verse, I am, I am a long ways but from being forgotten. I'm remembered by him. I'm remembered by him, and he remembers you. There's not a one of you that's insignificant in his eyes. It makes me think of what, Psalm, what David said in Psalm 8 when he looked up in the sky and he saw the stars and all the, all the, th and the moon and all the things in the heaven. He looked at everything around him. And he compared his size to what he saw, the magnificence of God's glory. And he said, who is man that you're mindful of him? And there's been times I have, I've, been, I've said that. Who am I compared to all this? Who am I compared to all the other people in this earth that you're so mindful of me, that you're so watchful over me, that you so wanted the best for me? Who am I? And the thing is, he loves me as much as he loves everyone else. He, he just wants to shower you with the best things. He says, and it says back over in verse 10, it says, and my sheep know me, or yeah, verse, verse 14, my sheep know me, if, meaning that if we know him, we know his name. And we've been given authority to use that name. In, in verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I go before them, and they follow me. And that's one thing we're going to talk about a little later, later is that section that says, My sheep hear my voice. Because that's a big aspect of, of, of hearing him, hearing his leading, is the ability to hear his voice. And if we're following him, that means he's leading I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I know everything about God leading us because I don't. And I don't think there's anybody alive that can tell you that they know everything and be honest about it. It's only through the grace of God that we know what we know and through teachers that have been before us like Kenneth Hagin and Charles Capps. That's how we know. Jesus said numerous things <coughs> excuse me, about the Holy Spirit when he was here with his disciples. And he told them those things because the Holy Spirit is how he's going to lead us, lead us through. We know that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and he's been here ever since. And he's been doing just what Jesus said he was do, would do ever since. I'm going to read now some verses in the book of John. And they're ones that we've all heard before, but let's listen to them again. 
Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. So let your ears hear what the Spirit has to say here. John 14, 16 through 17. And as I read these verses, and there's going to be a couple of verse, other verses we read. When I read these verses, I want you to see the certainty that Christ has and the faith he has in what he's saying. Christ is convinced that what he says is going to happen. Verse 16, I'll pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Man, there's a lot there in that verse. But what I want you to notice again is the certainty of Jesus' statement in his mind. There's not a doubt in his mind that what's going to happen happen is what he says is going to happen what he is saying is i will pray and the father will give you just let that sink in for a minute i will pray and the father will give you can we be so bold as to say the same thing can we put those words of jesus in our mouths i will pray and the father will give you if you look over in John 12, 49, it says, For I have not spoken. Wait a minute, make sure I got it. Oh, in John 16, 23, excuse me. And in that day you'll ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father on my name, he will give you. He's basically saying the same thing. If you ask the Father, he'll give you. If you ask the Father, he'll give you. But of course, there's some qualifications that go along. You've got to be in the will of God, and you can't be living in a life of sin, and you've got to be obedient to the Lord. But if you ask the Father, he will give you. So I can, I can, make, that, I can make that same statement. So who is he asking the Lord about? He goes on to say, The Father will give you the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. What Jesus is basically saying here is, Boy, you, Boys, you need some help. I mean, you need some real help. And the Father is going to give you that help. Notice it says that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they can't see him. Because they can't see him, they're not going to know him. And isn't that true? I know it was true in my life before I was a Christian. Because I couldn't see him, I didn't even know he existed. I never even thought about him. John 14, 26 Jesus says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send. Do you see that? He's still talking with certainty. He is still talking in faith. He is still convinced this is going to happen, that the Father will give you the Holy Spirit in my name. He will teach you all things. How many know if you're being taught, you're being led in a direction? He'll bring to your remembrance all things that, that I said to you. I don't know how many times the Holy Spirit has led me that way by bringing to my remembrance something Jesus said or Jesus did or something else that was in the Bible. I saw him and I asked him, what should I do? What should I say? How I should react in a circumstance? And invariably, he'll bring to my mind a remembrance of something in the Bible. That has, that has happened to me countless times. I think it's interesting that he uses the term helper here. Because think about what a helper is. A helper is there for our benefit, isn't he? He comes alongside us to help us. What he's saying here is the the, that the helper is a benefit to us. John 16, 13 through 14. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has, has come, see, he's convinced, he knows this is going to happen. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. In other words, he'll lead you into all truth. For he'll not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, 
and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a whole lot of leading going on there. And just as important to me, and it's and just as exciting to me, it also shows me there's a whole lot of speaking by the Holy Spirit going on there. It says he will speak to you, he will tell you things to come, and he'll declare to you. That thrills me. Because if he's speaking to me, that means I have the ability to hear him, which is what I need in order for him, for him to lead me. And he is continually doing this, and he has never stopped. He hears us, he speaks to us, and we have the ability to hear him. But there are many people, including Christians, that don't believe these verses as they're written there. They don't take it literally. They don't think that they have the ability to hear any of this stuff. They don't, have, they don't think they have the ability to hear from God. Many of them have adopted the view that God leads them through circumstances. They're looking outside themselves for their answers. They're looking outside themselves for their leadings. Just think about it. Would God take the time to talk to us if we didn't have the ability to hear him? I would say he wouldn't. I don't waste my time talking to that wall over there because I know that wall can't, it can't hear me and it can't talk back to me. So I don't, I don't bother with that. And, and God is the same way. He's not going to waste his, God is not about wasting time. If he's going to talk to you, that's because he knows you have the ability to hear him. God doesn't lead us by sending us to the school of hard knocks. And he sure as shooting doesn't lead us by hitting us in the head with a stick. He doesn't want to go whack, move here, whack, move there, come over here, whack, whack, whack. He doesn't send bad things in your life just to lead you to a place that he wants you to go. He doesn't want us fumbling around in the dark. He doesn't want to play, us to play games of hit and miss. He doesn't want life to be nothing more than pin the tail on the donkey. He doesn't want us to bump along through life guessing about everything. He doesn't want us living a life full of I hope so's. I hope I'm doing the right thing. I hope I'm doing this the wrong way. I hope I heard this right. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. God does not want to have you live a life of I hope so's. He wants you to look to him and hear what he has to say and allow him to guide you. But there are many people that don't believe that they can personally hear from God. They know about the Holy Spirit, but they're really vague about what he does. And I knew that was true for me when I first became a Christian. I was told who God was. I was told who Jesus was. But I was never really told who the Holy Spirit was. I know they told me that he lived inside of me. But I never knew what his purpose was. Not really. It wasn't until I, I got to the Bible myself and got under some good teachers that I learned who the Holy Spirit was. Praise God for that. Have you ever had a negative response by saying to someone, I heard the Lord say to me, or the Lord told me? Have you ever had a, a negative response to making that statement, that the Lord told me something, or the Lord said to me something? I have. And the usual response is, is the Lord did what? They'll roll their eyes, they may even laugh a little, and they'll say, the Lord told you, who do you think you are that the Lord told you something? You must think you're Jesus Christ himself for the Lord to be speaking to you. But no, it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder how they think the Lord leads them. What are they looking at for the Lord to lead them? And there's times when I've, I've talked to people, and maybe you have too, and uh, sometimes something will happen in our lives. It's usually something negative. You know, the car breaks down, they get a flat tire, they lose their job, they get sick, but it's usually a string of bad things that happen. And I've heard people say, uh-oh, I think the Lord's trying to tell me something. And I'll go, well, what do you mean? 
Yeah, the Lord just slapped me upside the head with these things, and I think he's trying to get my attention to tell me something. And I'll go, well, what are you going to do now? And, sometimes, <laughs> and the response is equal to them saying, well, I guess I'll just wait till he slaps me on the head again. Because they don't know what else to do. They don't know where else to look. They're just waiting for the next slap to tell them maybe they're doing something wrong. And so they t- make the next step. But that's not, that's not what God has planned for, no, for us. I don't know about you, but when somebody says they want to tell me something or show me something, I don't automatically think they're going to slap me upside the head to do it. <laughs> when the pastor, if the pastor says to me, I want you to step into my office or something I want to tell you or show you, I don't go in there waiting, waiting for the slap in the start. I don't go in there ducking and diving, wondering, wondering when I'm going to hit, be hit upside the head. Why? Because he's an intelligent human being. He can communicate with me, and he knows that I can hear what he's saying. In the same way as God. He's an intelligent being, and, he, and we've been created in his image so that we know, he knows that he can hear us. He can certainly communicate with us, and we have the ability to understand him. You don't have to turn there, but in Psalms 32, 8, it's 8 and 9, it says, I, the Lord, will instruct you and teach you in a way you should go. I will counsel you with my eyes upon you. Be not like the horse or the mule, which lack understanding, which must have their mouths held firm with bit and bridle, or else they will not come to you. God doesn't want to lead you around with a rope around your neck, jerking that rope, leading you here, leading you there. He is not into external persuasion. But if you insist on being led externally, then there's someone out there that's all too happy to do that and is looking for any way they can to mislead you and trip you up. But we're not here to talk about him tonight. (laughs) We're here to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't really believe that you can hear personally from the Lord, then what are you going to do with all those scriptures in the Bible that repeat over and over and over? God said, God said, God said. This book is full of hearing from God, and that's how this book got here. People heard from God, and they wrote it down. Where does it say in this book? Is there a verse you can point out in this book, particularly in the New Testament, where it says, I will no longer talk to my people? Because I haven't found it. And if it's not there, then he's still talking. Because he's not going to lead us down the wrong path. I'd like to take a a few minutes to look at an account of God leading two different individuals from two different cultures who didn't know each other and at the time were 40 miles apart. Now 40 miles might not sound like a long ways nowadays, but back then that was a long ways. Because the only way you got around was by riding a donkey or riding a mule or riding in a cart or walking on your own two feet. So it was a little bit of ways. And God took two people that didn't even know each other from, like I said, two different cultures, cultures and brought them together. One was a Gentile who worshipped God regularly and prayed to God regularly. He had a heart for the poor and, and regularly gave to the poor. The other was a Jew, and like all Jews, he had been raised to not have any contact with Gentiles. He, they, were, they were told that they couldn't go in their, a Gentile's house. They couldn't eat with them. They couldn't spend the night with them. They couldn't even start a conversation with them. The Gentile was Cornelius, and the Jew was Peter. Can you see the issue here? He had to take a person who had, was told his whole life not to have anything to do with the other person, and he had to lead that person to the other person and talk to the other person when he's been told his whole life not to do that. Even though Cornelius loved God and honored God, God knew that Cornelius was missing something, and what he was missing was Jesus Christ, the message of the gospel. And and God went about to fill that need, and how he was going to fill that need was to bring Peter in contact with Cornelius. Because what Cornelius was missing was in the heart of Peter. And how does he do this? How does he get these two individuals that normally wouldn't have anything to do with each other, how does he get their paths across? He does it by speaking to them. 
That's the amazing thing. He does it by speaking to him. And you may know the story. First, God sends an angel to Cornelius, and the angel tells him to send people to Joppa, which was where Peter was at the time. The angel tells, tells Cornelius who to look for, where to find him, what house to stay in. <clears throat> and then he begins working on Peter. He begins working on changing the thinking and renewing of the mind of Peter that he has about Gentiles. And through, and through the, and he does, and he speaks to Peter through a trance or a vision. And in the course of the vision, God says to Peter, don't call something unclean that I have called clean. In other words, if I've told you to do something, then know, and then know that, it's all right, that it is all right to do. Let's, let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 10, verse 19. And it says, while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, do you see that? The Spirit, the spirit is talking to someone, isn't he? <clears throat> the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. This is very specific, isn't it? What are you saying here? If one man shows up at the door, I haven't sent that man. If two men show up at the door, I haven't sent them either. If three or more men, or four, if four or more men show up at the door, they're not the ones I sent. But if three men knock on the door, rest assured, they're the ones that I've sent. Acts ten twenty. Arise, therefore, go down and go to them, doubting nothing, for I have sent him. Isn't that important? That's an important phrase that we could all use for advice. When God's talking to us to tell us to do something, doubting nothing. He's tell Peter, when you see these people and what they ask of you, don't doubt, don't stand around and doubt. Don't him and haw about what they've said. Know that I've told them and I'm, I'm in a favor of you doing what they said. Trust me and just do it. Are there times where it's a must to respond quickly to what the Lord tells you? Yes, there is. God was expecting Peter to respond quickly. Verses 21 and 22. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they say, Cornelius the centurion, a just man who fears God and has a good reputation among the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Now, I think it's interesting that when Peter eventually gets to Caesarea, and him and Cornelius are talking face to face, Cornelius gives him a little more detail as to what the angel told him. He says the angel told, told Cornelius to listen to and act upon what you say. And isn't that what we're all supposed to do? When we get to the clear direction from the Lord, we should be what? Acting upon what he says. When the pastor's up here preaching and you know he's under the anointing and it bears witness with your spirit and you know the spirit's moving on the inside of you, shouldn't we be acting on what we hear? Peter must have been shocked to see Gentiles standing there when he opened that door up. That's the last thing he expected to see. The Lord didn't tell him those Gentiles going to be coming for him. He said there would be three men. And he up, opens up that door and lo and behold, there's three Gentiles standing there people that he'd been told not to even talk with, and there they are, standing. And even more of a shock must have been when he heard that God had sent an angel to talk to Gentiles. He must have been thinking, what in the world is going on here? But there they were. Peter had to overcome fear because he is being asked to do something that he'd been his whole life told not to do. And how many know the closer you walk with God and the longer you with God, walk with God, you're going to have to overcome some fears for what he tells you to do. Because I know that's been that way in my life. He has asked me things. I said, oh, man, I just do not want to do that, Lord. But I've had to push those things aside 
in order to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. And that's what Peter did. And result of him doing that led the whole Gentile world, the whole Gentile world began to be opened up to the word of God. Now, when this was done and he came back to Jerusalem, the church leaders in Jerusalem called him before them because they wanted to call him on the carpet. They're saying, what in the world have you done? Why are you going to a home of a Gentile and speaking to a Gentile like this? Why are you talking about Jesus to the Gentiles? This is supposed to be just for us. And I love what Peter said in Acts eleven twelve. He says, the Spirit told me to go. I, I love that. The Spirit told me to go. That's what I'm striving for. I want to be doing something because the Spirit told me to go. And I want that for every one of you here, that when the Spirit tells you to go, when the Spirit tells you to step out, that you step out, that you go. I want to be able to say, and I want it to be said to everybody here, that the Spirit told me to go, and as a result, I went. Oh, man, I, to me, that would be a high compliment for somebody to say to me, Raj, I know you're doing it because the Spirit told you to do it. And because he told you to do it, you win. I want that for everybody here. Let's turn to, I want to look at this one portion of scripture. It's in 1 Kings 19. And we'll finish up with these scriptures here. 1 Kings 19. How many remember the story of Elijah the prophet and his dealings on Mount Carmel with 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah? <clears throat> and how he became afraid, afraid of Bathsheba because she threatened him with death and he ran away into the wilderness. Now I want you to stop and think for a minute what happened here. Elijah was at ground zero when fire came down from heaven and hit that altar and burned up the offering on that altar. <clears throat> he was at ground zero. I bet he was so close he felt the heat. And yet he became afraid. I couldn't think, I couldn't think of a more powerful demonstration of support for, from God. Here you are. This whole thing happened. The fire coming down from he heaven happened because Elijah called on the Lord and the Lord responded with fire. I can't think of a more powerful than, I mean, I would be blown away if I had something like that happen. But yet he became afraid. It was almost as if like, God, I believe that you can call down fire from heaven and consume this altar and help me win over these 850 uh, prophets. But I can't expect you to to, to protect me from this woman. So what did he do? Run. He ran into the wilderness. And that's where we pick up, that's where we pick up the story in 1 Kings 19.10. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in the place. Now why was he in the cave? Because he was afraid. He was hiding. He was hiding in the cave. And the, Lord, and the word of the Lord came to him and the Lord said to him, here we go again. God's talking to people. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I would love to have heard the tone of God's voice when he said that. What are you doing here, Elijah? Because I don't think he was mad at Elijah. I don't think he was scolding Elijah. I don't think he was yelling at Elijah. I don't think he was harsh with Elijah. I think it was more than something. I think it was more like something like this. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Are you here because you're, you did something that you wanted to do? Did you decide to do this or did I lead you to do this? Knowing fully well that he hadn't been led to do this. So who led you to do this? I don't know how many times in my life that God could have said the same thing to me. 
Raj, what are you doing here? Why are you in this predicament? Why are you at this place? Why are you at this, in this trouble? Did you s decide to get here because something you decided to do? Or did you do this because you decided to do it? Or did you do it because I told you to do it? And I've got to look at him and confess, <laughs> it's all on me. I'm here because of what I wanted to do. And it makes me think, and it <laughs> it's funny, it makes me think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, after they ate of the apple and they said, sinned and they were afraid, they were hiding themselves, weren't they? They were hiding themselves from the Lord. Just like, just like Elijah there, he's hiding. He's not hiding from the Lord, but he's hiding from this person. He's hiding. And God comes in, as we know, he comes in the garden, he's looking for Adam and Eve. He knows where they are. He knows why they're hiding. And yet he asks the question, where are you? Now what's interesting, what I think is interesting, that's the English translation of that verse. What I think is fascinating is the Hebrew translation of that verse, because the Hebrew translation of that verse is slightly different. And what God asked was, why are you where you are? Do you see that? Do you see the difference in that? Why are you guys where you are? Why are you hiding from me? Why do you feel like you've got to hide from me? Why are you in this predicament? Did you decide to do something on your own without talking to me first? Can you, can you see that? Why are you where you are? I think all of us here could say the same thing about certain things in our lives. Why are you where you are? I think that, I think that part is fascinating. So verse 10 through 11. So he said, Elijah says, now he's going to do the same thing at him. And he's going to offer up an excuse. God asked him a question. So I got to throw up an excuse as to why I did wrong. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he, God said, go out and stand on a mountain before the Lord. In other words, get out of this cave and come out here with me. Stop living in fear and come out here where I am. And behold, and, he, and Elijah does, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a, great, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Now the Lord was there. Scripture says that the Lord was out there when all this was going on. And in the natural, if you were out there, you would think, that the Lord was behind all this that was going on there. Things were being torn up. There was chaos out there. Things were flying around. And just by knowing that the Lord was out there and the power that he is, that's within him, you would think he was the one that was call, causing all this. But that's not what the scripture says, does it? He was, not, he was not the one that was causing all this to happen. How many, the Lord that the, how many know that the Lord can be with you in the middle of the storm and not be the cause of the storm? I've got many testimonies in my life about that where things were just raging around me, but I knew the Lord wasn't the cause of the storm, but he was my way out of the storm. I had to trust in him to get myself out, of, to get myself, to get me out of the storm. This shows us we need to have some discernment about what's going on around us, don't we? Just because things are happening out around us doesn't mean that God is causing that to happen in order to lead us to a certain destination. Just because it's loud and spectacular doesn't mean that it's God. And even though it may be spiritual and it's real, doesn't mean that it's from God. Because I know I've, been, I've seen some situations where it's been real, and it's been spiritual, but it had nothing to do with God. How many know that Satan can come in a, as an angel of light? Sorry, as an angel of light. I've seen stuff manifested that I knew wasn't of God. 
So just because it's spiritual doesn't mean that it's from God. I don't care if a 20-piece choir comes from down from the ceiling and starts singing beautiful music to what's in here. And we say, oh my gosh, how beautiful is that sound? But if they say anything that's against this word, if they see, say thing any contrary to what God has told you, then you need to disregard what they're saying. Because no angel is going to speak contrary to this other than Lucifer himself. Verse 12, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Now that fire has got to be God. If you were there, you would say that that fire has got to be God. But no, not this time. We have to be careful about putting God in a box and slapping a label on it and that says this is all you need to know about God. Because he's far more than can be contained in a box. But it says there was a still small voice, doesn't it? When God talks to us, it's seldom loud or spectacular. That's what I have found. In fact, what does this word, what does this verse indicate? That it's sometimes it's so soft they can easily be overlooked or disregarded. I know there's been situations in my life where things have been have raged around me, and I've had ten different people tell me ten different ways I should solve the problem, and they're getting louder and louder and louder. And then I hear this little, almost indistinguishable voice. And it almost sounds like it's a million miles away, but I know it's not. I know it's within me. But the louder the voices, the things on the outside get, and the more I focus on the outside, the less I can hear that voice. And I have to stop myself and quiet myself and sit and listen what that voice has to say. Man, there's times I could have saved myself a lot of heartache and a lot of money if I stopped and listened to what that voice said. I had to learn to listen to what that voice said. Voice said. And that and that still small voice doesn't need to be really any louder than that. God wants it small so that you have to purposely stop and listen to him. He doesn't want to be shouting at you from the rooftops, though sometimes I wish he did. There was times where before I I knew anything much about the Holy Spirit, I knew that God was dealing with me about something, but I had not a clue what it was because I didn't know enough to look inside for the answer. There would be times that I'd go out in the woods by myself. I'd tell Renee, I'm going to go out because I used to love deer hunting. I loved especially scouting out the area for deer. I'd say to her, I'm going to go out and scout out the area and see if I can pattern the deer. But my purpose of going out there was to talk with the Lord, to confront the Lord. Why aren't you telling me what I need to know? I know you want, you're trying to tell me something, but I don't have a clue what it is. I'd be out there sometimes yelling. Would you please tell me what you want to tell me? If, if it means writing it across the sky or whatever you have to do to get it through my thick head, why don't you, do, why don't you just tell me? But you know what? I never heard a word with these ears. It wasn't until I looked inward that I, did I hear any, anything. When you think about it, how loud does a person have to talk who's sitting right next to you in order for you to hear them? Not very loud, does it? They don't have to yell at you to get, get your attention and get you to hear them. Now think about, if that, think about it as, what if that was the Holy Spirit who's not sitting next to you but who's inside you. Remember what Jesus said, that that's where the Holy Spirit would be. He would be inside of you. How loud would he have to be if he's inside of you to to talk to you? Really not very loud at all. And that's how he leads us. He leads us from the inside, not the outside. He doesn't lead us through outside circumstances. He communicates with us. We've been given the Holy Spirit to empower us and so God can direct us specifically, specifically to the problem that we have facing us. We are led on the inside, for the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit, doesn't he? That's what it says to us in the book of Romans. He bears witness with our spirit. 
I thank God that in order to hear God, I don't have to go on a pilgrimage to a remote land. To hear from God, I don't have to make a trip to Jerusalem or someplace in Israel in order to hear from God. I don't have to search high and low for a prophet to get a word from God for my life. I don't even have to get out of my bed. I don't have to get out of my house. I don't have to get out of my chair. How many know that he'll even come and almost sit on your lap in a car? The presence will be so thick and he will talk to you if you'll give an ear to him. So I don't have to search high and low for him. Greater is he who is within you than he who is within the world. Is Christ in you the hope of glory? Now I want to finish up with this one verse. It's one of my favorite verses. And it's in the Passion Translation. I love the way this is, this is worded. It's Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. For the Lord God is one, and so are we. Is that true with us tonight? Are we one? Are we united? And if we are united, we should, there should be things that we have in common, shouldn't there? And that's what the Lord goes on to say. For we share in one faith, one baptism, and one Father. And, here, and listen to what he says next. And he is the perfect Father who leads us all, works through us all, and lives in us all. And that is where and how he leads you from within. Now that's all that I have for tonight, so I'll turn it back over to the pastor. You know, so when, uh, when you get up tomorrow, you can sit up in your bed, swing your feet out, and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That sounds like a great way to start your day. How about it? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, brother. Thank you for um, blessing us. Would you rise? And we'll close in prayer. And thank you for coming tonight. And uh, keep on charging forward, right? Nothing, nothing back there for you. Everything's out this way. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I, I do thank you, Father, for uh, Brother Roger. I thank you for his obedience and his faithfulness to you, Lord. And Thank you, Lord, for his humble spirit and his willingness to, to just uh, be a blessing, Lord, and to be used by you in whatever way that you have gifted him, Lord. And so, Father, we thank you for that. And now, Lord, I thank you that you're, you'll go with each and every one of us, Lord God. Father, may, may you keep us safe and may we be sensitive to your voice. May we hear your voice in, in, in all circumstances, Lord, and in everything. And, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for um, watching over our, our children and, and our grandchildren. And thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.